Hello and welcome to this edition of the Golf Channel Podcast with Rex and Lab. We are live from the Media Center at Marco Simone, host site of this year's Ryder Cup. And folks, we are recording this podcast from beanbag chairs uh, that they have conveniently left out. Uh, I can only think for napping on Friday and Saturday, two of the longest days in all of golf. It's the visual medium that <laughs> those are indeed our beanbag chairs. Rex, you've had yourself. Got away. You've had yourself. No, no, you, got, you got away. There it is. There it is. Hey, hi, friends. You have had yourself quite a day. You just popped on for about 45 seconds on live from uh, after work in the entire day. Uh, what did you say and how are you feeling at this point? Uh, fine. I landed yesterday, so it's, I'm still so I didn't sleep well last night. So it, I think today is actually kind of what I needed just to be outside and moving around. Otherwise, I was going to crash. Uh, I will say, what did I say? I said a lot of things today on live from I, I spent a lot of time on TV and it, it was a lot of fun. I guess the report tonight, though, was on Scotty Scheffler and his move to start working with on with, with Phil Kenyon, the, the putting guru from uh, Sea Island. And it was interesting. I talked with Randy Smith, Scotty's swing coach, about the idea. And he was completely on board with it. But the thing that stood out to me is he said Phil is only trying to work on simplifying things for Scotty, which I found interesting because I have spent some time around Phil. And he brings a lot at you. And it's like there's a lot of information, and he wants his players to know it. And he's a really, really smart guy. But my concern was, without having any other information, is it was going to be a fire hose. And Scotty, as we all know, the putting issues, we can go through the stats pretty easily. But we all know that he struggled with his putting so far this year. If, if Phil went to him and just opened up the fire hose, that was going to be an issue because that's not the way Scott Scotty's mind processes things. Like we know it. That, and I think I've asked him before about what shot link stats do you use at the end of the year to, you know, to sort of help you get ready for the next year. And he like gave me a glazed over look like, uh, no, man, like I know what I do well. I know what I do poorly. I know what I need to work on. And that hasn't been the case. I'm not saying there's a magical formula that's just going to click on this week however I, I did watch scotty quite a bit today he does look more comfortable over putts and he also looks like he has a better understanding of what he does when maybe he's not putting well and what he does when he is putting well wow we're kicking off this Ryder cup preview a lot of putting some news at the world number one on the eve of the Ryder cup not like he literally didn't start working with him recording this podcast on tuesday he didn't just start he didn't just start doing this today three weeks ago three weeks ago he has had at least a little bit of time to have some of these changes, mindsets, mentalities, techniques, whatever the case may be, bed in. That certainly is interesting, though, Rex, is it not? Right. At the world Got number the one, who who has had a uh, incredible ball striking season, the best ball striking season we've seen since Tiger Woods in his Historic. heyday, who has at time bristled at the suggestion that he is struggling with his puttering, not a good putter, uh, is making a change. It was reminiscent of what he did right before the FedEx Cup playoffs, you remember. Uh, changed putters uh, mercifully. Uh, he has since gone back, I believe, to the blade style putter. And now on the eve of the Ryder Cup, uh, when he's going to probably have to make everything, you would think, outside three feet. Or excuse me, inside, outside three feet. Like the Europeans are going to make him putt everything. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't if you? He's 151st, he's 151st the PGA Tour in strokes game putting. We've all seen some of the misses. We've all seen how it's cost him uh, in some big tournaments this year. Uh, it should be very interesting. Uh, Sky Shuffler is set to speak with the media on Wednesday. Rex, how otherwise has your Ryder Cup week gone? I was at Spain, the Solheim Cup. We'll get into that uh, in a little bit. But how about how about your week? You got to the golf course on Monday. Early impressions of Marco Simone. Obviously, if you're a huge fan of the DP World Tour, you've seen this golf course before and have studied it. Uh, however, I believe this is your first spin around it. What do you think, good or bad? I don't know if good or bad really comes to mind. I think I heard an official say yesterday that it's a good match play golf course, which is always sort of the ultimate backhanded. Oh, well, yeah. It's just a good like, match play just like Austin, Austin Country Club. I think it would be terrible yeah. for the stroke play, but like I absolutely loved it for the WGC match play. It, yeah, it's such a backhanded compliment. It's the, the, oh, bless your heart in the South. And I don't feel like that's particularly fair either because they have they've moved a lot of dirt around here to use metaphorically and actually just to make sure this is ready in time i know how difficult this was for them to get it ready to get all the infrastructure in place and once you see it 
especially on Friday when there's 50,000 people packed in and what they've done around the first tee. Like it's, they do what they always do. And it, it's, it's a pretty amazing build out. That being said, it is what we thought it was. It's going to be, it's not Le Goff National, the course that hosted the Ryder Cup five years ago in Paris, but it's Le Goff National uh, Light is the way I put it. Because they're going to make the Americans, they're going to try to make the Americans hit as many fairways as possible. They're going to try to take the driver out of the American hands. I don't know if it's going to be as effective this time as it was in Paris. It certainly did work to their advantage in Paris. This time around, I think the makeup of both teams is a little bit different statistically. The European team is a slightly straighter driver of the golf ball, at least based on tour stats from last year. I think the average ranking for the European team is 71st, and the average ranking for the American team is 80th. So you're talking, you're, you're splitting like it's decimal points at this point. I, I think where it's going to come into play is around the greens. It was funny. I was walking with a group this afternoon with the Max Homa group, and I was with a colleague of ours, Todd Lewis, and Todd was sort of you know rubbing his foot around in the rough and rummaging around in the rough, and it, Max Homa sort of hitting chip shots essentially right next to us. And Todd's response was, huh, it doesn't look that bad. And it, it, was, it was pretty quick that I came back with, a, hey, Max, Todd says it doesn't look too bad. <laughs> <laughs> not, not too and bad, Ma says, the, says, says, says the outside observer who then hops into his cart and drives up all of these vicious hills. Yeah. Who's just hacking balls out of the rough. And his response was, it doesn't, huh? I'm like, hmm, maybe you're not paying attention. Uh, it's going to be difficult. It is. It is. Around the it is thick. I mean, it is. Yeah. It is. There are thick blades of grass. The ball seems to settle in. Like I watched John Rom, who might, you know, pound for pound, might be the strongest guy here. Like absolutely muscling them out of the rough. I'm not sure it's necessarily going to favor either team. Like the players on the European side have kind of been Americanized with their style of play as well. Tee it up really high, hit it really far and go find it once again. Uh, I do think uh, it's, it's, it's actually dialed back from where it was a couple of weeks ago, which leads me to believe the European, the Europeans were, were finding too much of the rough as well. It's like, ah, this is, this is a little bit too penal for us we don't we don't need to make this kind of a a, a muscle fest and, and who can who can recover the best they they still want to put a premium on good driving and, and i'll say to your point i think i was talking with ricky fowler who was on the scouting trip with the u.s team a few weeks ago and he said yeah and i asked him yeah have they trimmed the rough because we'd heard that you know they'd kind of taken it down and he kind of rolled his eyes and he goes yes instead of eight inches it's five inches and to prove his point he dropped the ball and it disappeared and like, all right, so they, they've cut three inches off the top, but it's still five inches to the bottom. Like, it's still going to be very difficult. All that being said, I think you're right. It's not going to be – this isn't Paris. I, I think the bigger deal instead of the rough is going to be the green speeds because I think what you're going to do, and, and this is all part of the European plan, is to try to get the American players, primarily PGA Tour players, out of their comfort zone. And that comfort zone for them is anywhere in the 11, 11 and a half, maybe even 12 – on the step meter for green speeds. And it won't be close to that by the time they tee it up on Friday afternoon. I think that will be a bigger issue than the rough. Hmm. And I believe it was John Cook on our NBC Sports telecast. Or not John, or was it John Cook? Cook? I don't I know. I have seen Cook. I think it was, you sure? Or it, may, or it may have been Jim Gallagher Jr. who mentioned the green speeds and was kind of the biggest difference in why the Americans have not won uh, in 30 years. Uh, when they when they come over here, either they're not preparing they hard enough, they're not preparing well enough, um, whatever the case may be, not putting enough time in practice rounds. It all comes down, as we know, in the Ryder Cup to clutch putting. If you're not putting in uh, the hours, was his theory, uh, which I can kind of get behind. That that could be one of the, the main culprits for why the Americans have not won in 30 years. What do you think, Rex? What do you think on that case? Not necessarily. Let's 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 throw it out here like this. Give me the case why the Americans. Can end the streak, and give me the case for why they will. Let's for, let's first start with why they can. Uh, why they can? Uh, I yeah. think it's going to be, and this is going to be my mea culpa. This goes back to what you're waiting for. So so gleefully, starting for next week, this is when I capitulate and say that okay, I was wrong. Justin Thomas should be on that team. However, I just had a very spirited debate with our colleague Todd Lewis about this, and he said, "Can you imagine a scenario where it wasn't, JT it wasn't on air because you're." Because your hit was 45 no. seconds. It was not. Yeah, that, that wasn't it at all. It was why, why I was waiting to go on for my 45 seconds. He goes, can you imagine a scenario where JT goes 5-0? and oh? And I said, no, because I don't think that anybody's going to go five matches. If they do, I think something went wrong with both captains' game plan, to be honest with you. This is not a course you want to walk five times. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but that's not in their plans. I, I don't see that happening. I see him going 3-0. and oh. I see him maybe even going 4-0. Oh. 
these are professional athletes. I mean, this they're not like they're playing the tournament on Mount Everest. I mean, it's a difficult course to walk. Yes, but come on, these are these are finely tuned professional athletes. Let's so let's let's just just to just to use the most recent example, right? <clears throat> Covered the Solheim Cup last week on a golf course at Finca Cortesine, which was arguably, if not more, arduous to walk than what Marco Simone is. And before the week started. Suzanne Pedersen, the captain of the European Tide, said, "Ah, you know, I don't, I don't know. We're probably going to play players five matches, but it's, I mean, it's really tough. You, you don't want them to be uh, too mentally and physically fatigued." Two days later, she says she ha- she has three players go all five, and she said her plan was actually to s- to send five or six, at least five or six players, all five. In other words, do not trust what captains are telling you on Monday or Tuesday. I don't think Europe has any choice but to send out their dogs each and every time. That's Rory. We'll see. That's Rom. That's Hovland. That's probably Fleetwood uh, based on how he's playing in a potential partnership with Roy McIlroy as well in foursomes. And so, I mean, we'll see. I'm not buying, every, every I'm not buying it yet. Plan. Every captain's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And that plan could, could change dramatically by the time we get to Friday afternoon. I think I'm just saying I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't go with the fatigue. No, it's not even fatigue. I I I mean, look, you're right. The professional athletes, you're talking about five rounds of golf. You're talking about potentially not even playing 18 holes in each of the five rounds of golf. I think as a plan, though, as a blueprint and Luke is up against it on that, to your point, is he's probably got to send his dogs out a little bit more than what Zach Johnson is focused in on. From Zach's perspective, he's probably thinking, no, I want my guys as fresh as possible. I think you and I both have sat and talked with Paul McGinley about this idea, the way Paul sort of manipulated the week. And that's, I I don't mean that in a negative way at all. And I think it was with Graham McDowell where he sat Graham all day on Saturday, but before he did it, he pulled him to the side and told him that, man, I I've got to have you on Sunday. Like you have got to be at 100%. Like I, your point is going to be crucial to us. Whatever you believed it or not, doesn't matter. But not only was Graham McDowell not angry, but he was fired up to get to that first tee on Sunday. So I get what you're saying. Anybody can go out any of these athletes can go out and walk five rounds in, in these conditions. I think most of the captains, at least these two captains, would rather that not happen. I could see Xander Shoffley and Patrick Cantley going all five for the Americans. I don't mm-hmm. see anyone else. I guess it kind of depends on how Sky Shuffler and Phil Kenyon's putting tips. Uh, if, if, I can, if I can take hold and get him started hot on Friday on the European side, yeah, I see a number of players. You didn't actually answer the question for making the case for the oh, Americans. Why the Americans? If, 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 you, if, you want, if you want me to start... I, I think I think I think it starts and it ends with the competitive DNA of this group. Jordan Spieth, I thought was really good in his answer on Tuesday in describing how everyone wants to talk about this three decade drought uh, and stretch of futility across the pond. And yet more than half of this American team was not even born when this group last won on foreign soil. These are players who are j- most generally in the same age range who have played against and with each other for 10, 15 years, even dating back to junior golf. They're incredibly uh, and intimately familiar with each other and they share the same kind of mean streak competitively where they're not daunted by the task that's in front of them this week. If anything, I think they're excited about it. There's no, there's no dread in saying, oh, we haven't, we haven't done it in 30 years. Here we, here we go again. It's, no, I want to make history. That's how these guys are wired competitively. That's what they've always done. That's why I think if you're Zach Johnson, that should give you the most confidence with the matches a couple of days away now. Uh, to your point, half the team was on the team in Paris five years ago when they lost. So I, I get what you're saying. You're right. This is a very much a new look team for a lot of – different reasons and i don't think this is some sort of collective neurosis i don't think it's just because the americans can't wrap their mind around winning in europe i don't think that that has anything to do with it i think zach johnson said it on monday when he talked with the media it's just hard man it's just really really hard to do you're up against a really good team and as we've talked at length on this podcast so far the golf course is always set up against you and the crowd is just brutal like there's they're going to hear things this week that they would never hear over the course of their professional careers it's just really really hard it's not because there's something in their dna that makes it they're incapable of doing it it's just hard uh, i mean i think there was maybe a a softness to those teams 
in the 2000s. You had players like Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson and Jim Furyk and Steve Stricker who all were, were part of that team but had dreadful Ryder Cup records when it comes you're to this. I mean, I guys certainly... soft? Is that what you're doing? You're calling Tiger no, I'm and saying, Phil Furyk No, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying that's the co- those are the cores of the team. And I think on the periphery, how you fill out those rosters, I think was a little mm-hmm. bit soft, a little bit doughy, a little bit who could be, uh, be I think, undone. I think undone by the pressure of trying to win on foreign soil. Yeah. And like a, a couple of writers were asking uh, uh, the players today, like, how do you rewire yourself and get accustomed to hearing people cheer against you? Right. Like it's. It's a, it's a foreign concept for professional golfers on the PJ Tour. You're never getting jeered, you're never getting, you know, uh, scolded unless you're, you know, Brian Harmon trying to win the Open Championship and people are calling you Brian the Butcher, uh, or, or telling you that you don't have the stones uh, to do this. Like it's very very uncommon, and so I think that takes a little bit of getting used to as well. But if you're a JT, if you're a Xander, if you're a Spieth, um, if you're uh, Ricky, Ricky's not a great example. A uh, Sam Burns, I, I think all those, all those players, in their careers have shown they're wired differently, and can use that wow. as fuel and motivation. When I don't think that's always been the case for these American teams. Uh, I'm sorry to go back and answer your question. I, I think they get it done because of the balance. I feel like the American team is deeper, and and whether or not if that's it's true always or deeper. not. We'll- it's always deep. It's always deep. It always feels deeper. But I feel like this feels like Georgia playing UAB, which I know is still too difficult for you because you probably couldn't really, really dig you into call the it. Europeans UAB. No, I'm not. It's the depth of it. Maybe Colorado and Oregon's maybe a, a better example where Colorado is clearly a talented team to, to do the, you know, the, 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 the headline of the day. Colorado is clearly a talented team. Oregon just had bigger, stronger, faster athletes and more of them, and they could just keep throwing them at them. I think the depth of the American team is how they get it done. You, he, Zach Ooh. doesn't have to rely rely Ooh. on his horses. And to that point, who on the European think, side is the weak link? Uh, we don't know yet. I mean, we're going to find out, right? I mean, I think I mean, you just I w- admitted that America is the deeper team. You just admitted that. You just said that. No, you agreed. You came back with America has always been the deeper team. Yes, historically they have always been the deeper team. This year, I don't think the gap is as great, probably not as we've seen in recent memory. I don't expect probably Bob not, McIntyre, but we don't know. I don't expect Nikolai Hogard to play more than one T batch. When you when you talk about sending those dogs out over and over again, whether it's Rory Rory Rom Hovland Fleetwood, like someone's going to have to sit. And I think if you're looking at weaknesses, it would be those two players. But Luke Donald has yeah. the ability because of his depth one through ten at least. That he can play those guys one time, probably in a four ball session, and and be off off and running. Well, and you're you may be right, but we don't know because this is such a new look team. And I kind of wrote about it tonight that the idea, if you want to look at both teams through a microscope and decide, okay, if you were taking what Liv Goff has done specifically to the Ryder Cup, it's easy to identify that, oh, the Europeans have, have taken a, a worse hit. And by that I mean probably no one nobody more so than John Rom. I mean, John Rahm is missing his best friend. He's missing his security blanket. He's missing his Baba or whatever it is you want to call it. And Sergio <laughs> Garcia. Well, and because he had always been there. I mean, they were undefeated his last Baba. time around. Isn't that, did your kids not call it their bottle, their Baba? Is that, is it, was that not a thing? Uh, I'll get you 10 missing, bucks if you say that I'm live from. <laughs> that John Rahm is missing his, is missing his Baba this week. Please. Uh, I said I said juicy bits today on live from, and I, I was waiting to get fun. get a, get That's an fun. email. It turned out that was that fun. Mean, I was just kind of that could mean that could mean many things. I was kind of parroting it back to uh, the co-host. Um, uh, the the point I'm trying to make about the depth is, even if and today was a good example. I think if you looked at it, and you and I talked about it on our live from hit this afternoon about this is not the pod system. When you looked at these pairings, you could see remnants of it. You could see sort of the skeleton of what Paul Azinger did back in 2008. But Zach made it pretty clear. Like, no, like I, I have a, a general idea, but I'm not locking these guys down into three groups of four and you have to eat together and sleep together. And, and everything you do is going to be done within these three groups because he has that versatility. And by that, I mean, I was walking with the group that had Colin Morikawa and Max Homa. And the idea, and I think you and I discussed this, those two make pretty good partnership. Like it's pretty easy to go. Yeah, yeah. Both from California. They're a close friend. Tom, nice. Our friend Tom just took a picture of me. Tom, Tom. you're going to get multiple shout-outs on this. 
Tom Carlisle, thank you so much for all of your hard work and hey. trying to secure me uh, an inside uh, the ropes pass. Although you were not successful such a, personally, that is uh, such a saga. The amount of time and energy that you have wasted in, try, in trying to get <laughs> you one uh, is certainly is certainly appreciated. I owe you five thousand uh, dollars and some tips on how to actually smoke ribs and not run out of charcoal. So we woof, that was a tough story. Uh, so Morikawa and Max were going to be an easy pairing together. They're friends. Their games are similar. They're from California. The whole nine yards. I walked up and fully expected that to be the case. They were play, obviously playing a match. And it turns out Brian Harmon was paired with Homa. And Ricky Fowler was paired with Morikawa. And I think that's an indication of, I think Zach sent them out and wanted to say with the message that I want all of you to see how you play together, to see how you mix, to see what holes you like, to see what holes you don't want to tee off on, whatever the case may be, to see if you like that guy's golf ball, to see if you don't like that guy's golf ball. I think that's the strength of the American team. That's an interesting segue. So that's actually what I wrote for NBCSports.com slash golf on Tuesday night about how the pod system is not necessarily gone or eliminated. It does feel kind of Rex like it's, like it's these remnants of a, of a bygone era. And I think you could even look at what Stacey Lewis did last week for the Solheim Cup, where she got rid of the pod system, which they've been using since 2015, in hopes that it creates a more unified team. And what Zach Johnson is doing this week is borrowing not from Azinger in 2008, but a lot from his predecessor, Steve Stricker, at Whistling Straits. How he's basically giving the 12 American team members, everything at their disposal they could possibly want and trying to keep their preparations as similar as it would be to uh, a tournament at Riviera or a tournament at Augusta National. These are highly trained, highly motivated professional athletes trying to weigh them down with, with, with clutter or making it kind of awkward um, to, to fit inside the confines of a team is something that they're trying to eliminate. And so that, so the, the, the pod system, which was so rigid and so strict, it obviously worked wonders in 2008. But there is no captain really since then who has followed that to a T. All the captains since have kind of put their spins on it. You can kind of see Zach Johnson doing that as well. Obviously, data and analytics is a big part uh, with, with Scouts, Inc., in collaboration with the assistants, trying to make sure that the that the pairings are right, particularly in foursomes, getting not just the pairings right, but but letting the players know where they're going to be teeing off on odds or even holes. So there's, a, I think there's a lot of fluidity, a lot of versatility that didn't exist. And the reason why I think this is such a benefit to the Americans is by going away from the pod system and kind of powering all 12 guys, you're keeping guys in their usual routines – you know, save for a, a couple of dinners that they have to do during the tournament week. They're more invested because now they're being held accountable for their own preparation and they're comfortable, which I think is no small thing to discount in what's the biggest pressure cooker that these guys face the entire year. So I think this is the shift that the Americans are going uh, and, and is a reason why, though I don't think they're going to win, uh, I don't think they're going to play as poorly as they did. Uh, in Paris as well. Rex, what's the case against them? Why why can't they or why won't they end this streak I mean, of futility? I'm, uh, to circle back around, really, and just to not not even to defend it, but to point out, I think Paul Azinger created a system for the team he had. I don't think Paul ever created a system that he thought was going no, to work for no. every team. If you look at uh, that, that was, specific team. That's kind of the blueprint. That was kind of the blueprint of having guys with like styles of, of play and personality. It, it's, it kind of transcends golf and, and goes in other aspects. Like you could see how that would work on a team of 12, right? Like I think there's some, some concepts that they're certainly borrowing from, um, but to, but to follow it as uh, strictly as they did 2008, I think is, I think has been eliminated. To answer your question though. And, and again, this has nothing to do with, with Paul Azinger. I think the argument against is pretty straightforward. I think what you end up with with a team like Europe, it, I could sit here and say it's been 30 years for a reason, as I just pointed out, because it's hard. I really like the fact that the European team seems a little bit better in form, and we won't know that for sure until we start getting into the matches. But if you look at – certainly they competed more recently 
than most of the American teams. Certainly they look like if you look at what they did at the BMW PGA, if I'm taking, and I guess this was the conversation I had with Todd too. If you do this, just like we do on a Sunday afternoon, when you're looking for matchups, you're looking to find your advantage anywhere. And I lay out those five players that you just talked about. Rory, John Rahm, Tommy Fleetwood, Victor. I'll even throw your boy Ludwig in there. Look at those five and the possible pairings they can create with that. Go through the American team and tell me why you think the American team can beat them. Like that, That's just a strong, powerful group that you can throw out there. And if you're looking for matchups, it's hard to find matchups that can beat that. I mean, if those players don't play well, right? Like if 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 Rory has another stinker like he had at Whistling Straits, if if John Rahm can't find a partner that can bring out his best game, if if Ludwig Aberg somehow becomes overwhelmed by by the moment, then the doors is obviously going to be wide open for the Americans. I I just don't I just don't see that. And you bring up a a very uh, pertinent point as it relates to kind of rest and recovery. Versus having some competitive reps coming in. You look at a player like Matt Fitzpatrick. He played three times since the Tour Championship. And now is playing the best golf of his entire year heading into the Ryder Cup. His, his record in the Ryder Cup is terrible. But he's at least given himself the best opportunity to play well this week. And so I'll be curious to see if the five weeks post East Lake kind of dog the Americans. And if the uh, run-up uh, on the DP World Tour helps the European players rex who do you think is the mvp of both squads not necessarily going to uh determine the cup but who do you think will play the best on either side i think based on recent form you'd have to pick victor on the european side i mean you look at what he did through the playoffs look at what he's done since the playoffs i think he's much more comfortable this time around he's been in this situation he understands the the nerves and the pressures that come along with it so that's an easy choice and i i mean again i wouldn't be surprised if john rom or rory or tommy or any of them have good weeks, but I feel like Victor is probably best positioned for that. On the American side, it's a little bit more interesting. Going back to our previous conversation, if somehow, and again, this is incremental gains. If Scotty finds a way to go from 151st on tour and strokes game putting to 51st, I, I don't want him to be inside the top 20. Don't even be inside the top 50. Just stop giving that many strokes away on the greens. I think he could have a very, very good week. I, I think that's a big if, because for them to click that quickly, I would be honestly – a little bit surprised. You kind of go down the list. I think you're right. I, I think either one of the Xander Schauffele, Patrick Cantlay, they seem to have such a temperament for this event. Like neither, neither one of them seem to ever get an elevated pulse rate. Neither one of them seem to be bothered by the outside atmosphere. For certainly Patrick Cantlay never seems to be bothered by anything going on outside the ropes. I can see either one of those guys being sort of the MVPs for the American team. Yeah, it's tricky because right, they're they're a they're a package deal. When it comes to the Americans, like their success is is, is wholly dependent on each other. Xander Schauffele and Patrick Kelly went three and zero in uh, team play back in twenty twenty one. Obviously, their the Presidents Cup record uh, is outstanding as well. My my MVP on the American side was going to be Xander Schauffele, not just because I picked him to be the Player of the Year in twenty twenty three, and yet he does not have a victory. Uh, but you look at the way that he's been trending at least uh, before this five or six week break uh, following the the, the the Tour Championship. He was starting to play uh, the best golf. He has, I think he has the perfect temperament for this uh, and obviously the perfect partner in Patrick Canley. On the European side, I, I can't wait to see how this Victor Hovland, Ludwig Aberg group comes out. If that that team has the potential. You're, you're, you're guaranteeing they're going to be paired together? Is that what you're doing? Uh, guaranteeing? No, because there are no guarantees. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that they're going to be trotted out uh, at least twice. Uh, in this team format, I think they could be incredibly formidable, um, and a, a team kind of like a, a Cantley Shoffle that you just kind of pencil in here uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, and that's maybe uh, what are the, what are the strength. I mean, they're both twenty five or younger. Uh, I absolutely cannot wait to see how those two play uh, together. In particular, Rex, we have two more days until the Ryder Cup kicks off we'll be doing a mini pod on thursday immediately following the announcement of the foursomes pairings apparently there's some sort of controversy uh, with luke Don luke donald choosing foursomes first uh, uh historically uh, traditionally europeans do fare Four. better uh in four uh, excuse me foursomes 
play an alternate shot format uh, to start. That's always been the American weakness. It's been a, a little bit um, of, a, of a harbinger of success for the Europeans. What do you look most looking forward to, to seeing or hearing over the next two days before we actually get to the pairings? First tee. I mean, you and I both were in Paris five years ago, and it's it. The Ryder Cup is special, no matter where it's being played. Certainly the build-up does not feel the- quite as big around the first tee. Did you get that it's same act- impression? It's actually bigger. I was talking with Guy Kinnings, who's in charge of Ryder Cup Europe, and he was telling me the actual grandstand itself is going to hold forty-eight thousand people. That's wrong. Forty-eight hundred people. Whoa. Sorry. No, I was had to, say- had to do the math. On- <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Had to do the math on that. No, that's not right. Try again. Forty-eight hundred people. The grandstand around the first tee in Paris held 6,000. So technically you are correct, but then you have much a lot more corporate just down the right-hand side off the tee. Ooh, eh? You yeah. actually have our, our set, which is right there, right in the mix of it. It's a really cool spot. And hi, then you have – you have uh, hi, Jess. Actually, you know what? I made the argument today. I, I don't know. Yeah, you were up on the set. So it's gla- it's enclosed by glass. And I kind of asked. You, 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 it's hot you up were, there. It's very hot. That's not even what I was asking. My pro- my point was, you've been to these before, and they're always open air. And I'm like, why didn't we do open air? And like one of the sound guys go, well, it's going to be too loud. And I immediately piped in, and we've had this conversation before, and like game day seems to work okay. Like why wouldn't we use the crowd? Why wouldn't we embrace that? And, and I didn't know I did this, but I set off quite the debate internally about maybe they're going to knock the glass out by the time we get to Friday. So stand by, you guys. I made, a, made some sort of uh, corporate decision. I mean, they absolutely have to. Why would you have a cloistered environment for a pregame show leading into the most boisterous environment that you that, that you could have in golf? And anyone who's watched live from this week, we are right on top of the first tee. It's a great location. And, and again, last time around at Whistling Straits, it was an open-air environment on the first tee, but it was about 50 yards down on the right-hand side. Mm-hmm. You weren't quite right in the middle of the cauldron. And, and I, I, we've had this conversation before. The best environment is game day, right? I mean, that's you don't have to get excited when you've got – 5,000 people screaming at you. It's pretty easy to get excited. So why don't we do that? Um, but it is. It's technically, it's a bigger build-out. The answer, long-winded answer. It's it's a different shape, I know. It's not quite as high vertically, which I don't think will produce quite the same noise. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. I might have to I might have to volunteer uh, in some info to the production manager and knock out that glass as well. Like, we don't even have a, we don't even have a pregame show on Friday and Saturday. They're starting too early, so I don't think noise... Uh, would actually be uh, an issue. Uh, we have to wrap this podcast, Rex, because we are literally shutting down the media center on Tuesday of Ryder Cup week. There's no, there's nothing I would rather do on Tuesday of Ryder Cup week with the Ryder Cup actually three days uh, still to go than to be here at nearly nine o'clock, pitch black, having to catch a shuttle that we will certainly be riding uh, alone. We can go a little deeper on the Thursday podcast with some of our impressions of Rome. Uh, one of our media member friends uh, got pickpocketed on the train. Uh, so we should have a couple more uh, great stories to share. Uh, I'm sure our friend Tom, uh, if, if he does uh, light his uh, Weber on fire, uh, once again, uh, he'll be able to share some information as well. Shout out to Russ uh, for securing me inside the ropes pass. We'll have plenty more to get to in two days. We do another Golf Channel podcast with Rex Love. One of the great weeks in all of sports. We've got to wrap it up for now. Make sure you go to NBCSports.com slash golf. All of our news, notes, features, commentary, analysis, live from hits, and Rex's 45 seconds of power alongside T. Lou. We'll talk to you guys on Thursday night. Tom, you're the GOAT.